Hey guys, welcome back to the Prehistoric Life Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Crawford, and today we have Garrett from I Know Dinosaurs. That way, I Know Dinosaurs. So, I mean, would you like to talk about what you do? I mean, sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I also wanted to compliment you on your logo, it looks very good. We need to get a new logo. It's making me feel logo envy. <laughs> That's excellent. Uh, yeah, so I, my wife and I, Sabrina, so Sabrina and Garrett is the duo of us. Um, we have a podcast called I Know Dino. We've been doing it for nine years. We talk about dinosaurs. Um, back when we started it, there weren't any weekly dinosaur podcasts, and we wanted to learn about all the new dinosaurs that were being named. So that was like our original goal to cover every new dinosaur discovery. And we, after a little while, we're like, "Uh oh, are we going to run out of stuff? But there's so much new stuff all the time that we never run out. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to pull their uh, YouTube up. So there it is for all of you. Thanks. I, I, I remember which way to point that way. <laughs> check it out. Uh, <laughs> is there like a place where you can see how many videos you've uploaded or something? Oh, man. I don't know if it tells you. It would be a lot. Oh, it says 1.1 thousand videos. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, you have <laughs> like a, a thousand more than I do. <laughs> Some of the videos, we sort of cheat. It's like double as many as there should be because we have a we do like the dinosaur of the day segment within the episode and we split that out as a separate mm. video. So it's like, I think we've done 470 something podcast episodes. So that's what you wow. see if you go to us in like a podcast app. So then that would be like 950 videos, but then we've done a few other videos. So I guess that got us to a yeah. thousand plus. <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Give, give her, give or take. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm at like a measly, maybe a hundred. <laughs> I mean, it's really quality over quantity. Our really? ratio there of oh. subscribers to videos isn't great. What is that? Like only 10 subscribers per video? <laughs> well, well, I'm at I'm at 59 videos, so you got me beat. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, So, I mean, I guess the basic question that I start off every interview with is what is your favorite dinosaur? So my favorite is Ankylosaurus. It's... You know, you know, Ankylosaurus. It's got the big club tail. I'm yeah. wondering if you're going to grab a model of it somewhere. <laughs> oh, I am. <laughs> I got to clear my side view off here. Um, I don't think I actually have any near me. I do. I got, actually, funny enough, I got this one yesterday. Oh, I had, nice. Because I was doing it, I was going to do an episode on the woolly rhino, rhinoceros, mm -hmm. and it was the website I was using was buy two, get one. Or mm -hmm. buy one, get two. And so I was like, Anglosaurus, why not? <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yep, that's my favorite. It's the biggest ankylosaur. It's uh, by a pretty wide margin. I think it's like 30 feet long compared to the All next right. biggest. It was like maybe 20-ish. So that's cool. Although after it became my favorite dinosaur, I learned about Anodontosaurus, which has a way cooler tail club spike. So I like that one a lot, too. And then I also really like Dinochirus and Therizinosaurus just because they're so weird. So those <laughs> I are, think, yeah. Those are very unique. Mm -hmm. And um, what is it? What is it called? The uh, Actually, it's right here. The osteoderm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of them, but fossil crates. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I got one of the osteoderm molds that they sell. Oh, cool. So, That's a good idea. <laughs> and for everybody who doesn't know what Therizina source is, here it is. <laughs> I've got this is probably my favorite part of the interview is right before the interview, being able to just pull everything out. Mm -hmm. Just going through all my like drawers and shelves and finding things. So I'm like, yeah, it's a good idea. I like how you have an extra camera too pointed down so you can see all the stuff. That's very good. I got to get something to put the, uh, because it's one of the um, I have a spare cord here for some reason, um, like one of these. Mm -hmm. But I have another camera that I need to figure out something because the computer I'm using only has two slots, so I need to figure out mm. a, something to put like two in one slot somehow. I have to find something for that, but 
Yeah, That's it should problem. work on an adapter, but you know, sometimes adapters don't work right. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, so I guess I got to ask, what got you into dinosaurs? Uh, oh, man, I honestly don't remember when I was a kid what got me into dinosaurs way back in the day. I know the first dinosaur thing I had that I really liked was this stegosaurus hat and its legs were like big ear flaps. It was a winter oh. hat. It was like a big red, like it was like wearing a stuffed animal on your head, basically. <laughs> that was like my favorite thing for a long time. I think I wore it until probably like fourth grade when everybody else had moved on from dinosaurs. And it was like, what are you doing with the stegosaurus hat? I just really liked it. Um, <laughs> At yeah. that age, you're like, dinosaurs are still cool. Why we yeah. dinosaurs? Exactly. Yeah. And then um, I rediscovered my love of dinosaurs as an adult with Sabrina going to the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and that would have been like 10 years ago now. So that was what got us reintroduced into dinosaurs was going to the our favorite museum, partly because it's where we rediscovered our love of dinosaurs. But they just have so many cool displays. They've got, you know, one of the most famous T-Rex of all time. They've got, you know, the Brontosaurus or Apatosaurus. And now they have Patagotitan there. There's just so much cool stuff in that museum. It's really inspiring. And Ankylosaurus. <laughs> hey. So, I mean, I, what got me into dinosaurs? Well, the first thing I had was this Allosaurus right here. Nice. And it's actually why <laughs> Allosaurus is my favorite dinosaur. Just because it's basically what started my journey. And uh, it's that really old... What was it? Uh, I think it was History Channel special. Walk the Walking with Dinosaurs Ballad of Big Al. Oh yeah, I was gonna ask. That kind of looks like the Ballad of Big Al. Allosaurus. I think it is something from that. <laughs> My parents were just like, "Oh, he really likes that. Maybe we should find something from that." <laughs> and then, on top of that, uh, yeah, Jurassic Park didn't really <laughs> help. Did not edge me away from it. So that dove me in deeper. And I know Jurassic Park is probably a cheap answer but it's probably what got a lot of people really oh yeah into dinosaurs yeah there was a huge surge of paleontologists that were like people that were like 10 ish or like even 5 to 15 maybe when jurassic park came out there's like this big surge in dinosaur paleontologists that came once they got to college age because it's it's so many people right it reached it was the biggest movie of all time i think it was one maybe a billion dollar movie maybe the first billion dollar movie it was like crazy how huge it was just as a movie and then in terms of like dinosaur movies it's just on another level so yeah I definitely mean, i can only like imagine what like right after the movie because <laughs> i mean everybody was probably like we got to get in the truck, go find some dinosaur bones. We're going to bring back some dinos. Yeah. I don't remember exactly when it came out because I was only like five when the movie came out. But my wife was in a similar situation where like everybody was really interested in dinosaurs. And then because everyone was thinking about paleontology because of Jurassic Park, it was making any kind of paleontology discovery was in newspapers because it was like everyone's thinking oh, about yeah. it. everyone wants to learn more. And there was a whale discovered somewhere near where she lived. And so she was going out, like digging in any dirt she could find, trying to find whale bones or like dinosaur bones or whatever. And it came out June, June 11th, 1993. Yep. Yeah. So, so a few days after my birthday. Well, not my birthday birthday, but yeah, date wise. <laughs> I'm not, like a I wasn't decade or two that, before. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean. The only one of the very few things that I found was actually this. Oh, God, that glare is <laughs> here. I got the side camera for this reason. It's this um shark tooth. I completely oh, nice. forgot the name of the shark. Mm -hmm. and now I feel really bad. And I'm going to get a message from somebody later. And I know exactly who it's going to be. It's <laughs> this, shark, this shark. But I mean, I just went to like it was after I did an interview with somebody and I went to my family with my family to Folly Beach and I was just like, I'm walking around on here. I might as well just start looking down, seeing what I find. <laughs> I just saw that shark dude there and I was like, I guess I won. <laughs> nice. I mean, because I dinosaurs have just never really went away in my life. Yeah. Cause I mean, at a certain age, you're just like, 
dinosaurs and that like is the only thing you think of because you're like like got that young brain that as like i grew up i was just like i don't really like i've never really just stopped liking them Mm -hmm. that's just i mean i my goal is to become a paleontologist in fact that's why i'm going to college to get a geology major i mean nice so i mean so i guess you and your wife stay on top of um all of the dinosaur content that comes out. Mm -hmm. So I got to ask, have you seen prehistoric planet and what was it? Life on our planet. Yes. Yeah. We watched prehistoric planet. I think we got lucky and we got like an advanced screener. So we got to watch it a little bit before it came out, but for life on our planet, we didn't see it until way after like months (laughs) later, we totally missed that it was coming out and, I guess I didn't realize how many dinosaurs were going to be in it. So it, it was like totally not on our radar. There were surprising, like very few. Yeah, it was. But, they were in a lot of the episodes, but you're right. It was like not that many dinosaurs and they tended to be like just sort of a small piece of the story in each episode for the most part. And I, that that is a little critique I have with that show. I'm like, I kind of wanted to see dinosaurs more. They were here for a really long time, but it's also like. It's a little bit why I like the the uh, show too, because it's like you always get these shows about the dinosaurs, but like nobody ever shows what came before them or after them or about the megafauna that was after them. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that was before and after and around them that <laughs> really shaped life. I mean, so I, I am happy that a show like put that out there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because a lot. I mean, I think. <laughs> That might be the biggest critique that I've heard for Prehistoric Planet is like, oh, we're just looking at late Cretaceous dinosaurs and it's not covering too much else that was in the ecosystems and not covering too much other time. But Life on Our Planet was like such a broader, you know, it was a lot of ocean stuff. It was a lot of earlier stuff, like you said. So it it covered a lot more ground. But then it's like, do you do a shallow, you know, understanding of a wide breadth or do you do a deep understanding of a narrow it's just, they're both good. <laughs> I mean, I'd have to count real quick because I don't, I should probably have this thing memorized if I'm being honest. Um, how many sections are there? So you got uh, the Cambrian, the Ordifician, the Silurian, Carboniferous, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. Ooh. Paleogene, Neogene, and then core internal re- I don't know. <laughs> the last one. I'm not good with mammals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So there's about twelve major chunks. And if y'all don't know what I'm counting on, I mean it's just, I'm just counting the blocks on this one. On this really cool poster that I got. I don't even remember where I got it. I think I might have that same one too. <laughs> they have some, well, I'm disappointed uh, myself. I don't remember where I got it, but it's a really good poster. I mean, yeah, because like, so if they broke it up and there's like twelve chunks and they broke it up into those twelve chunks, they could do twelve episodes and focus on one. Yeah, that's true. And I don't think that's what they did. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I. They could have done that, but I mean, the way they did it was still really good. So, I mean, I still liked it. Yeah. But I got to ask, which one did y'all like more? I mean, we like Prehistoric Planet better just because it's got more dinosaurs and we know the people that made it better. (laughs) So we're a little bit biased. Um, And it's just, yeah, I love it. I really liked, also it came out first. So it had this like first mover advantage because it was one of the first things I had seen that put lips on pretty much all the dinosaurs. I think Life on Our Planet also did, but since it had already been in Prehistoric Planet, I did. there were a couple things I liked better in Life on Our Planet, though. I liked the, I want to say Arkansaurus. I can't remember. It was an ornithomimosaur from the southeastern U.S. that had running around. It was very colorful, very feathered, and really cool yeah i remember what you're talking about i honestly don't remember off the top of my head either yeah that one was really cool and i liked the 
they had Anki Ornus in there, which was cool mm -hmm. because since that's not late Cretaceous, they obviously didn't show it in prehistoric planet. And they did a really good job recreating the scientific understanding of its coloration because that was the first dinosaur where we looked at the feather melanosomes, these old microscopic structures, and figured out, okay, these parts of its wings were probably black, these parts were probably white, and these parts were probably reddish. And they basically took the exact scientific understanding and made like a 3D version of it running around and jumping off cliffs and stuff. So that was cool. That was cool. I mean, I got nothing against life on our planet. It was a really good show. Really good narrator, Morgan Freeman. You can't go wrong with Morgan Freeman. I love mm -hmm. his voice. But I feel I'm I'm in agreement with you. Prehistoric Planet had that that little edge where you get to see not it was the late Cretaceous, so they focused on one time period where mm -hmm. the dinosaurs really were at their prime. But it also wasn't just like Oh, here's late Cretaceous. Here's what's going on. They feel like focused on each biome. It yeah. wasn't all over the place. And I like that. And also, uh, what was it? David Attenborough mm -hmm. was the narrator. I'm a little biased towards him, too. Yeah. <laughs> Just because his brother was John Hammond. Oh. <laughs> so the brother brought back the dinosaurs, and then the other brother narrated about them. Mm hmm. So, I mean, they got like a family of dinosaur stuff now. Yeah, that's very true. So, I mean, yeah, David Amber is great too. I, one cool thing about the prehistoric planet is that it was made by the same people that made all the BBC, like Planet Earth, Planet Earth 2, Blue Planet, all that stuff. And they, when we, we got a chance to interview them and they were talking about how basically they shot it the same way so they would figure out like okay if you had a camera crew here what angle would you be looking at the dinosaurs from and all that so it sort of put you right in the middle of it and then we were watching life on our planet we realized they did the same kind of thing they took the same approach of like <laughs> this is like a a film crew looking at it it's not like the 90s documentaries we were used to which is like just perfect often still yeah but like, if not still just like panning shot of dinosaurs like moving like perfectly gracefully and everything where it's like the cgi at the time could not handle like moving cameras bouncing around and stuff like it needed to be a steady camera shot yeah <laughs> so it didn't it was cool because it looked like you were looking through a lens into what was happening yeah. at the time, but it didn't make you feel like you were there. It didn't give you like the human height perspective of what was going on, which gives you a better sense of like scale yeah. of everything. Or like everything is basically pointed up. It's like ah. <laughs> the yeah. sauropods huge, the T Rex is huge, the Velociraptor is kind of small, but then there's other raptors that are like eye level. So, yeah, and, and that's one thing that I always get. It's hard to wrap my head around whenever I'm watching like dinosaur documentaries like that because we we've all seen Jurassic Park. You see the T Rex like hulking over like the tiny little human, and you're like, oh wow, this thing is huge. But whenever you're watching like a dinosaur documentary, I'm like, that thing looks tiny. Mm -hmm. It looks like I could like like just stand up at it and I'd be taller than it, or it's like the same size as me, but it's like three times my size, and I'm like okay i don't yeah you know, like or the other other the other way happens it's like this thing looks massive but it's actually like my size yeah that's true like, yeah, it's tricky uh, to get the sense of scale when there isn't a human there because <laughs> uh ceratosaurus mm -hmm. always has that problem with me i'm always like oh it, it looks like one of those really large theropods i mean it should be like towering over a human but it's like the same size as a human yeah it's definitely a lot well, smaller than t-rex yeah <laughs> uh, definitely longer definitely weighs more mm -hmm. also could definitely kill a human very easily but most of these creatures can um yeah <laughs> even the herbivores yeah i mean that that's another thing like i like that they showed some stuff about herbivores like being defensive a little bit not mm -hmm. just like oh it's a predator might as well roll over and be food now yeah because i feel like that's something that really gets misunderstood because some of these herbivores were like 
nasty. <laughs> they were dangerous. And especially yeah. sauropods. Like, I love sauropods. But I don't believe they were the gentle giants that you see all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, because that thing is like the size of a building. So imagine if it got like a stomach ache or something. Mm -hmm. You And like it spooks the herd. I mean, you got like a whole forest gone at least. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. They probably could knock over trees pretty easily. They're just so big. I mean, we know elephants knock over trees and they're, what, a tenth the size of the biggest mm -hmm. sauropods. So, <laughs> like, imagine like a herd of Argentinosaurs getting spooked by something. It's like yeah. you're getting a whole forest leveled. <laughs> I mean, and there's like, we only know like what, 3% of all dinosaurs, of all yeah. species to ever exist, I think it was. That's yeah, sounds about right. So I think like, it's it's so hard to know, but yeah, definitely a small, small fraction. It's like how much of that, how much of the story are we missing? Mm -hmm. How much of it will we like never discover? I mean, there's so much that we are just like missing. Yeah. And it's so crazy to think about. Like because we see like an ecosystem in like paintings and things with these dinosaurs here, this predator looking at it here, maybe another species or two here. But it's like, what if there was like 16 other species that we just don't know about that was there? <laughs> yeah. I remember one of the first things learning about how things fossilize and how there are certain ecosystems that really just don't fossilize well. So especially like rocky, dry areas. So if there's mm -hmm. like, you think about where like snow leopards live, where they're kind of on like cliffs and, you know, places like that there's a decent chance that if there was a dinosaur living there that we'll just never know like what that dinosaur what like it, it's just completely gone and never fossilized at least not in a place where a human ever encounters it because that's another thing it's like even if it did fossilize a couple times a person has to coincidentally find that rock which is exposed yep. at this point in geological time and recognize it as a fossil and then take it out of the ground within the first couple of years before it erodes away. So it's, there's so much serendipity about finding fossils and how we know what we know. Definitely. Cause it's that preservation bias. I mean, mm -hmm. cause the world was not the same as it was 66 million years ago. Yeah. So how do we know that there's not like a billion more species just under the ocean? <laughs> That's true. And like, I always just think about that. Like, cause you always get this, like, because I I've heard like oh there's dragons, everybody's heard that. I mean, in your first thought, oh it's just dinosaurs, but it's also like maybe there was something that was dragon shaped. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, it's very possible. <laughs> I think a T Rex is kind of dragon shaped. I mean, yeah. it doesn't have the wings, but <laughs> in terms of its mouth and everything, it's pretty dragony. Uh, I mean, if I saw a T Rex and I was just like. I don't know what a T-Rex is. I'd be like, uh, I hope this thing's not still alive. <laughs> That's true. Just found like a tooth. Oh, God. That would be... Because um, one of the things that... So I'm from South Carolina. So one of the things that we get a lot are megalodon teeth. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. This is just a mold of one. I've yet to find one. I will. <laughs> I'm saying that now. I will find one one day. Um, But, I mean... They like the uh, I was about to say the Mesopotamians, that's the other side of the world. The Aztecs, like, they would find these and they would think that's like a scale. Mm. They kind of, I mean, it kind of looks like a scale, so yeah, they would use them in like rituals and wear them as jewelry for good luck and things like that. And they thought it was like a god. And it's like you start to look at that and you're like, that doesn't really, you look at it and you're like, oh, they're just being goofy, it's a big shark. And you're like, if you look at it from their lens. This shark has been extinct for God knows how long. And they just find this big thing washed up on shore. They're going to be like, uh, should we, should we start praying to someone? What is going on here? <laughs> yeah. I mean, cause I, like, I always 
I, I've talked to like a few archaeologists and they're like, yeah, we found like shark teeth and things and pottery and like embedded in the pottery inside of it on jewelry, on like corpses and things that we've dug up. And I'm like, so clearly there's some kind of correlation and it's it's like some ritual thing. And it's mm -hmm. just so crazy to think about. Yeah, that's really cool. Megalodon teeth are so cool. I don't have a Megalodon tooth yet either. I went to um, the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's like one of the biggest fossil trading yeah. places. And I was looking at their Megalodon teeth and I was very envious, but they're very expensive. So I think your strategy of going and finding one is a good solution. <laughs> I didn't find this one. Well, I did. I found it online, but yeah. <laughs> that's the point. I mean, also just like a mold of one is really cool. Yes. My uh grandfather before he passed, he he went out and he found a megalodon tooth and it's like mm. he has it in this uh case and it's just surrounded by other megalodon teeth or not megalodon teeth, I wish mm. other shark teeth and he has entrusted it with me. Entrusted oh, it cool. To me, Very nice. Which is it's like ah oh, god. I mean, I can only like imagine. Like you're just like swimming and you see this giant thing swimming and you're like, oh, that thing's tooth is the size of my hand. And I, I mean, mean, I feel that way even about modern sharks. I don't like to <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's scary. <laughs> I don't want to go swimming with a great white. I see people do that and I'm like, meh, I'll pass. <laughs> yeah. What am I? Favorite things that I le I learned from life on our planet is that like the extinction of Dunkleosteus is the reason mm -hmm. why like sharks have come to be, hmm. and that's that's so crazy to think about. Like if Dunkleosteus didn't go extinct, what would we have today? Because it wouldn't it wouldn't be sharks. They wouldn't be as top predator as they are. Hmm. And I mean. So, I sadly live in the state where we don't get jack squat when it comes to dinosaurs. Yeah. We got, like, some mammals. We might have, like, a little something really far up north, but we get a lot of shark teeth, mosasaur teeth, dolphins. We have a lot of, a lot of dolphins. And um, I visited the state museum, <laughs> and they... They were in the middle of building their database, and I remember walking in there, and they had all these cool things. Like they had like a giant uh, elk and like some like other mammoth tusks and things in the back corner. And I look over, and it's just like a pile of bags. And I'm like, "Huh, I wonder what's in those." Every single one was like just dolphin bones, huh? Species, and I'm like, "Well, I guess we do have a lot of dolphins." Yeah, that's interesting. He's like, oh, yeah, these were all donated. Now we got to put them in the database. And I'm like, you have a lot of those. Yeah. I mean, I haven't been able to go to many um, museums, which is kind of upsetting for right now, but I will go to a lot. I will mm -hmm. venture out and go spread out and find some stuff. But I went to Alaska. And that's one of those places where you're like, oh, there's nothing there. <laughs> they have like a whole ecosystem of dinosaurs up there. Mm -hmm. There was a lady with her own private collection. and She had, um, what was it? Pachyron, like a Pachyronosaurus skull, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Just sitting up front. I'm like, wow. It's one of those uh, formations up there, Prince Creek Formation, is yeah. like, you get like the Nanoquisaurus, Pachyrhinosaurus, Troodon, some of the smaller, actually a pretty big Hadrosaur. And I'm like, that's it's like, whoa. But you also have that area between Alaska and Russia and Siberia. And they found, I have a poster up here. I don't know how to, I'll send you a picture later. <laughs> they got, there's Therizinosaurus tracks. They got like uh, 
sauropod tracks. They got lots of mammals up there from when the land bridge was bringing over. They got some like fish and things from when it was underwater. And it's just like, I wonder what you'd find if you dived off the coast there. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I mean, because dinosaurs aren't found everywhere, which is the thing. I mean, you need very specific conditions to fossilize them. But where those conditions are, they are abundant. Mm -hmm. And that is so amazing to see. I remember going to Utah. Dinosaur National Park. <sighs> Beautiful National Park. You can just walk around outside and you'll just be like, hey, look at this wall. Oh, there's like three fossils. <laughs> it, it, it makes you feel like you get that paleontologist experience without actually becoming one yet. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And that's... And personally, I am a little bit more biased towards... Hell Creek Formation, don't get me wrong. Love it. Amazing formation. A lot of cool stuff there. T-Rex is there. Triceratops is there. You got some of the hard heads like Pachycephalosaurus and Sticky Molek. You got Edmontosaur. Really cool, but I got a thing for the Jurassic period. Mm -hmm. Well, you, if I, you like Allosaurus, you got to go to the Morrison. <laughs> I like Allos Allosaurus, uh, Ceratosaurus, Dilophosaurus. I, I'm personally biased towards those. And when I went to Dinosaur National Park, I got a juvenile Allosaurus oh, yeah. hand mold. We and bought that thing, same thing at Dinosaur National Monument. <laughs> it's so awesome. Uh, and it is so cool. The, uh, my brother made a joke about every um, paleontologist has their own centerpiece. Mm -hmm. that is my centerpiece yeah yeah it's I mean, really cool imagine like finding it though just out in the field you just like digging in a way and you find like a claw and you're like oh it's a claw and you dig up like a whole hand <laughs> yeah because my I mean, favorite thing about that fossil is that it doesn't have the claw sheaths on it so the actual claws would have been significantly bigger oh yeah <laughs> It's and just nuts. Also, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was like juvenile Allosaurus. Interesting. I didn't know that about it. So, it's like, that thing got bigger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it's also weird to think, because you see some of them and you're like, oh, well, obviously, like, sauropods are big, uh, velociraptors small, things like uh, ceratopsians tend to be that medium range. Theropods are kind of in that large medium range. But I like to – so humans have the missing link between apes and humans, whatever was in between there that we don't know. I like to call dinosaurs the missing link between birds and reptiles. Yeah. Yeah, if you think about like the early – because there were earlier diapsids and stuff. And reptiles that are like you know the more what you think about like the sprawling reptiles their hips are or their arms are aren't under their hips so no yeah dinosaurs. like the most famous example is like dimetrodon or dimorphodon dimetrodon mm -hmm. whatever the one is with the sail i always get those two mixed up and they're completely different <laughs> <laughs> and so i'm always I'm always like oh yeah Dim dimorphodon and they're like you mean dimetrodon no i mean dimorphodon no, you mean Dimitron. It's like, yeah, <laughs> I meant that one, the one with the sail. <laughs> mm -hmm. One of the things I, I'm curious about is, did Dimitron evolve into Spinosaurus? They're pretty separate. So like Dimetrodon is sort of more of a, people say it's closer related to us, which it isn't in time, but in terms of like the family tree, it's like, it's a technically a synapsid. So it's like, on the way to mammals, whereas all the dinosaurs are diapsids, which are usually people sort of call them reptiles, but reptile is kind of a weird word because it doesn't include birds. So it's not, <laughs> it's like a, a small Reptilian chunk. Bird. <laughs> yeah. So the, um, I guess, you know, like we are kind of what Dimetrodon evolved into, whereas Spinosaurus obviously came from the diapsid side. 
So, you know, you've got some of those early things like Nyasasaurus maybe, or, you know, some of those early dinosaurs from Brazil would be what you'd be looking at. Not at the same time, but a little bit the closest you can get in dinosaur terms because that Metrodon was like Permian. I always love looking at the, um, like the time. Cause you're like, Oh, T-Rex would be like fighting a Stegosaurus or something. <laughs> it is like, no, it's more likely for a T-Rex to be texting someone. Than <laughs> be fighting a Stegosaurus. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. One of the, um, one of the most bizarre things that I learned was that, uh, mammoths, they were still around during like Egypt. Mm -hmm. There was a little like pocket of them, a little island of them. And I was just like, when I figured that out, I'm like, so you're telling me King Tut could have rode a mammoth into battle. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they built the pyramids. Not aliens, but mammoths. <laughs> that would be really funny. Cause I, I like the archaeology side. I'm archaeology side. Eh, he can't speak. Um, but paleo is definitely more. Or, oh yeah, paleontology. I guess would be the correct term. Would be is definitely more my strong suit. Because mm -hmm. I mean, you, you always end up learning about humans forever in school. And after a yeah. while, you're like. Like, oh, where'd this culture go? Oh, they were wiped up by that, by that one. Where'd this guy go? Oh, he's dead. And he, he died to that culture. You're like, oh. But, like, the dinosaurs didn't really... They weren't starting wars as far as we know. Who knows? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe they were. <laughs> Dinosaur <laughs> faction wars. Who knows? I mean, it's very possible. <laughs> and, um... Ooh, there it is. One of the big... I say big projects, but it was like a 30 minute episode and I was a little disappointed that it didn't last that long, but it took me a while to get some research was the histiography of paleontology. Histiography. So it's the history of history. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so it's the history of history of paleontology. But I guess technically since paleontology isn't, necessarily its own thing it's just history of paleontology but i just mm -hmm. want to use a fancy term um so one of the most crazy stories that <laughs> is on here is the guy that created the time blocks like the first time blocks he was a professor and he was leaving school one day to go to like lunch or whatever and he fell down a flight of stone stairs oof but that didn't kill him. He waited a whole day to die to a brain hemorrhage. No. Oh. Which is like, was it the stairs or was it something else? Because the stairs didn't seem to kill him. Like, they put that there and I was like, oh, don't tell me he fell down. He slipped down a flight of stairs and died. And they're like, no, nah, he died the next day. It's like, wait. Huh? Because I was expecting, when I was reading it, I was like expecting him to just like fall down the stairs and that was it. And I was like, hmm. That's a little sad. They're like, no, he made it to the hospital. I'm like, huh. He died from brain hemorrhage, though. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> that would have been quite the story to tell everyone. I mean, you could probably still summarize it as he got killed by falling down the stairs because he probably caused the hemorrhage and it just mm. didn't kill him immediately. But... He probably hit his head. Yeah. <clears throat> but, excuse me. Um, My personal favorite like major paleontology thing is the bone wars mm -hmm. cope and um marsh both complete idiots <laughs> but i love studying what they discovered and i mean 1877 to 1892. It's a long feud. That is basically a lifetime. <laughs> no. I think it's about, what is that, 30, 40 years, give or take? I think it's 15 years, right? 
My math is way off. <laughs> I'm way off. <laughs> I'm for a calculator. Hang on. I should be able to do this basic math. Yeah, 15, 15 years. So maybe a lifetime in that time. Who knows? Hmm. Um, but there was 136 species discovered. Yeah. Which is crazy to think about. So that is about nine species a year. Mm -hmm. And I mean. Have you looked at any because you can look up their actual like papers when they name these things. Some of them are funny because they're just like one paragraph. It's like we found this, you know, it's like a list of a couple bones and they're like, and we're naming it Velociraptor. Like moving on, you know. <laughs> Velociraptor wasn't actually one of them, but <laughs> no. Iguanodon was, I think. I think, yeah, you've got um oh man. There's List a every few species go. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. It's hard to remember exactly which ones they found. They were a lot a lot of them were in the Hell Creek, but they weren't doing they didn't find T Rex. No, that was uh persons, I think. I know they got Camarasaurus and Monoclonius, which I Scott, think they also w. got Scott Triceratops, <laughs> which uh, like Monoclonius was like a weird name for Triceratops. W. Scott Persons discovered T. Rex. Um, well, he didn't discover. Well, he, he wrote about it. He wrote about it and named it. I think like, T. Rex Scott Persons yeah. is still alive. I think. Um, Barnum yeah, he Brown discovered it in nine or discovered it in 1983. I think Barnum Brown found T Rex in like 1903. Let me just double check. <laughs> Maybe I need to update my journal because I oh, it's Osborne. Well, Osborne named it, but I think Barnum Brown found it. Barnum Brown was Triceratops, I think, wasn't it? He found a, a lot of good stuff. He was like yeah. one of the most famous. He didn't name that many, but he did find a lot of them. That's the other thing. When we first started the podcast, we'd be like, what was it like finding this when we were talking to somebody who wrote the paper? And they'd be like, oh, well, I wasn't really involved with the finding. <laughs> this other person found it, but yeah. I wrote it up. Because now writing up a dinosaur fossil is so complicated. You have to write very specific format it has to be pretty detailed depending on which journal it is they have all sorts of different requirements for pictures and you know like different sections and things so it takes people months to write these things up whereas back in the cope and marsh days they would it was like writing an email they just like jot down a few notes and they'd be like okay camarasaurus it's got bigger teeth than diplodocus all right moving on to the next discovery <laughs> it's like you look at camarasaurus and then you look at brachiosaurus and you're like Oh yeah, these are these are very close together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll call them a different species and count as two. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> I love I love researching the um like the people who like name and discovered the dinosaur. And it'll be like a list of people, and then you'll just see like Marsh or Cope. And I'm like, of course they did. <laughs> it's like, of course you just toss them in there. Yeah. And yeah, um, they were really prolific. They were just like, not only were they taking each other stuff, they would like hire people to go raid other camps and things like that. They were like, um, they like steal each other's fossils and things. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, how many did they destroy? Yeah, it's a bummer. Like, There's this species. Drop. Uh, that species didn't exist. <laughs> it's like, wait. Because, <laughs> I mean... I've personally never been on an actual dinosaur dig. I'm sure you have. Yeah. So getting them out is very difficult from what I've heard and what from what I've seen. You have the to only be... thing we got out was a little piece of shell, personally. But we saw people digging out bigger stuff. <laughs> it is a very long process. But again... Back then, they didn't. They were a little more fast and loose with. Yeah, yeah, we don't out. care. Just chip it out of the wall. And we'll call it a day. We'll glue and it documentation back too. Like nowadays, you set up this grid, or you set up like a little GPS device, so you very carefully document the orientation and the position of every single bone. 
But back then, they didn't even necessarily say where it was from. Or they'd say, like, it came from hill number four. And you don't even know what that means because that was just like, <laughs> like what they were saying when they were at the camp. And then once everybody came home, they're like, I don't remember what Hill four is. So yeah, <laughs> like that's Hill one, that's Hill two, that's Hill three, that's Hill four. And we don't care about the rest. Um, yeah. All right. You guys ready? Go home. <laughs> Wait, what state were we in? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they traveled a lot. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I could only imagine all the just, random stuff that they found that was just like because i mean i trust their word they definitely did a lot of good work i'll use it loosely (laughs) but i mean uh, they were definitely rushing a little bit oh yeah yeah that's the main issue is the rushing and like you said the the sabotage and stuff was pretty uncool yeah, it always ends up getting something destroyed, and then you're like, oh, well, we just lost something. Like, yeah. We're going to ignore that. <laughs> um, But, I mean, I could only imagine all these cra- – because they were basically in, like – I don't want to say the height of paleontology because technically it had been around for a while. But they were definitely, like, the height of early paleontology. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we wouldn't – dinosaurs weren't really a household name we were talking to somebody who was you know like one of these history of paleontology um professors and he was saying how like before martian cope and the bone wars people when they talked about paleontology were usually talking about either like human evolution if they believed in evolution at the time but or you know like other apes and things or they were talking about like actually plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs and stuff were way more popular so these like marine reptiles and it wasn't until martian cope when they were really putting on display some of these huge, you were crazy dinosaurs yeah <laughs> that's Whoa, when dinosaurs took off and that's when people knew the word dinosaur before that dinosaur was like you know a word like i don't know some some really obtuse scientific term like I, I, I get to this from like one. astro philosophy or something weird. Yeah. Yeah. Or just like some obscure dinosaur, like, you know, like Stygie Moloch or something yeah. that most people don't know. Uh, so, I mean, you do like dinosaurs of the day. Mm-hmm. I got to ask a dinosaur that I kind of focus on a bit too much, maybe. And it's just a very random one. And I honestly don't know why. Epidep Octorix. Mm-hmm. Epidepteryx. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. Let me see. <laughs> Epidepopteryx. We have a cheap cheat sheet for some of these things. It's going to take me a while to find in here, won't it? Oh, it's towards the back. Ah, I saw it. I think we'd go with Epidexeteryx. That's probably how we'd say it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's that is a cool one. It it is definitely a very cool one, and I think they were nocturnal, if I'm not mistaken. It might have been nocturnal. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's hard to know for sure, but certainly, you know, you look at big eyes. That's usually what people say. It's got big eyes. Yeah. Maybe it was like nocturnal. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that is one of those things that it's like. That is just one that I I personally found, and I was like, I don't know how many people know about this. I'm gonna do an episode on it. Mm-hmm. That's how, because I don't mind doing an episode on T Rex and Brachiosaurus, even Allosaurus, Velociraptor. Actually, it took me a really long time to do an episode on that or uh, Velociraptor, which mm-hmm. I was very surprised by, and Triceratops and all that. But like the like random ones that I've done, um. But like like that one and there's a few once i get to the back they start getting more obscure mm-hmm. um andrew sarkis disseranosaurus uh like a few of the um sauropods uh, sauropods like brontomerius even like pachyrhinosaurus other versions of, of, of blah, blah, other versions of things mm-hmm. like like Beckley's spinax 
That's one of those dinosaurs. It looks very Spinosaurus like, but it wasn't. Well, I mean, similar, but it wasn't Spinosaurus. Mm-hmm. And is that one a um? Is that one of the oh, what do you call them? Baryonychines or whatever, like close relative of Baryonyx. I think so. I want to say it is, but it. No, I think it's just like a theropod. Dino- Y'all did an, a- an episode on it. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's probably been a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just look up Beckleia spinax. It's like one of the first things that pop up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, takes me a while to share the screen for some reason. That's weird. <laughs> it's like, oh, let me do some research. Oh, right here. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> but it kind of has that spine kind of mm-hmm. thing it's got like the protruding spine i think it's uh it looks more like acrocanthosaurus if anything yeah i think i is the uh, holotype i don't know how much if we found anything since but it's basically just that back so really all we know for sure is that it had yeah. that bump on its back and we don't really know anything else but it was, yeah, that was old. So that was like 140 million years ago. So that was would be extremely old for a Spinosaurid. Um, and I'm guessing based on some details in the vertebrae, they can tell that it's not an actual Spinosaur. It is really interesting how many things in the fossil record have yeah, these spines. Yeah, so that, that picture, that's like, that's what we have of it. That's it, just that little tiny piece. And the rest of it is just pieced together from similar relatives because... yeah you know you got to do and, something uh, what is that oh what is the other one that just that actually just looks like this one oh uh, con- concavenator. concavenator yeah or concavenator yeah concavenator that's one of those other ones that is like just really bizarre that's really fun mm-hmm. to look at <laughs> hey it could be a relative of that who knows i mean i think that one is uh a little newer let me see i, I think it is too but um yeah, it's, it's close. It's only like 10 million years newer, more recent. <laughs> only 10 million years. Like, <laughs> yeah. wait, wait a minute. In paleontology terms, that's like nothing. But to us, it's such an extreme amount of time. I remember I was talking to somebody about um, uh, anthropology. <laughs> and I was like talk, thinking about it in like paleontology terms. And they're like, that was like. 6,000 years ago. That was so long ago. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. what? No, it's not. And I'm like, oh, I guess for humans it is. Yeah. (laughs) When you're talking about like evolution of species, it's interesting because it's like, well, all of human history is just like one of these little pieces. Yeah, it's very short. We're talking about tons of the pieces. (laughs) Um, But but it's funny because like you think about things in like paleontology terms, like human studies, and you're like, oh, it was... 40,000 years ago you're like oh that's a lot for humans but then you like look at it the grand scheme of things you're like <laughs> that's like that <laughs> that's yeah. like not even like one of these it's not even like the thickness of that line no <laughs> it's not yeah because <laughs> these are in terms of like millions of years mm-hmm. it'd be like eh. <laughs> it's like eh. barely nothing so i mean and that's why i feel like it is hard to date dinosaurs and things like that like i mean because you can always carbon date something Mm -hmm. and i don't i personally don't really know how accurate that is it doesn't go back that far is that you got to use one of the ones is like uranium lead dating you can use for dinosaurs and there's a, there's a couple other radiometric dating things you can use that go a lot slower than carbon dating. Both those chemicals don't really seem safe. Yeah, that's true. Well, why are we combining them? Who thought of this stuff? That's a good point. Like, I, I, I want to know what was going through these people's head whenever they, they like just combine things like that. They're like, what if we mix uranium and lead? Like, um, you do know well, both of those will kill you, right? In this case, it's like it's like the naturally occurring uranium. Yeah, and it, not, it, not the death uranium. I mean, it's boom. 
Yeah, so, yeah, it's not enriched uranium, but it is still radioactive, so that's why it works because it's like over time the uranium decays into lead as it loses neutrons. So it you end up, I guess, <laughs> and protons. So you end up with lead at the end of the of the process, and you can look at that ratio of like how much uranium to lead is there, and then I you'll mean, see, okay, it's you know, it's new because there's still a lot of uranium left. It's still pretty radioactive or like, ah, oh, it's mostly lead. It must be super old. Yeah, I, like, I think finding an exact date is, I don't want to say impossible because I'm sure we'll be able to get to that one day. But for right now, it's, I feel like it's nearly impossible. Yeah. Yeah. There's usually plus or minus like a million or two years. Which is why, like, to uh, and that's like all of human history. That's like plus or minus all of humanity. <laughs> just, yeah. just error bars for paleontology. Like even megafauna outdates humans. Mm -hmm. Like uh, right, right here. I just happen to have a woolly rhinoceros skull um, from fossil crates. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, it, it looks similar enough to like just a modern rhino. Mm -hmm. and even like the build of it i actually have one right here because i was going to do an episode on it um but they look similar to modern rhinos just covered in fur mm -hmm. so i mean you have that and then you have normal rhinos and then you have like humans aren't, aren't like anything in time period yeah we, we think we're tough but we're nothing <laughs> it's like wow i liked one <laughs> Um, I think it was a museum curator or somebody we were talking to and they were like if you stretch out your arms and that's all of human history if you just file down a nail a little bit that you just erased all of human history like if this is the history of the earth your arm span just like a tiny little bit yeah. of your fingernail that's human history <laughs> oh wow because I mean we're fairly new mm-hmm which is just crazy to think about because you think about how far we have come from like, we basically like, I don't know how to word this. We kind of tamed the planet, if that makes sense. Yeah. Now we we're, certainly like now we're destroying restricted it, but, like, a lot of other animals regions. <laughs> I mean, we <laughs> created we zoos. Are, we are the meteor for megafauna. So yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that's a little sad, but, Mm -hmm. it, True. It, it's just how humans are, I guess. I mean, we evolved for intelligence, not strength. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, you think about how far humans have come, and it's almost like we did that really fast. Yeah. In terms of like humans ourselves, we did it really slow. But in terms of like the world, we like just popped up one day and we were just there yeah yeah if you think about i've heard people talk about like the fossil record if you're looking for humans or something like what would be the thing that you saw millions of years from now it would be so much stuff it would be probably garbage but it would be like like you're saying like overnight there wouldn't be like a oh here's when they developed you know bronze and here's when they started burning coal and whatever it would just be like all at once you know just a huge band of like chicken bones and beef <laughs> remains and all that kind of a plastic all just mixed together into like a wow something went crazy here for a while and added all sorts of stuff to the record because i mean <sighs> humans are so young that we can like find places where early people were mm -hmm. and it was not that different yeah and not that long ago <laughs> it would be like slight change like like there was no way a t-rex was just going to end up finding like a stegosaurus thagomizer and if there was it was a very slim chance mm -hmm. and it would have been like a little point sticking out of a rock somewhere but you can just go to rome and like slap the coliseum i mean it's it's there you can like it's not and that seemed like so far away for like human on human standards mm -hmm. but it was not that long ago yeah 
That is one of those very bizarre things. And it's hard to wrap your mind around. I mean, yeah. Yeah. kind of why I mean this stuff is so interesting because mm-hmm. I mean if dinosaurs didn't go extinct would humans even exist probably not I all- mean <laughs> they managed to keep mammals as sort of like a subordinate level <laughs> for you know almost back in line say, 180 million years so like another 60 million years like I don't see us finding a way to start no. <laughs> taking over it, it if anything it would be like some weird underground people yeah some weird burrow people or something mm-hmm. we'd be really tiny we'd probably be marsupials yeah maybe like a lemur lemurs are yeah up in the trees maybe but there are a lot lemurs of dinosaurs in the trees dinosaurs. too yeah give or take well, <laughs> some of them mm-hmm. it's kind of, it's very hard to just generically say dinosaur Mm -hmm. because you you say something like yeah lemurs are as old as dinosaurs but you're like which ones (laughs) yeah they they i do not think they were in the jurassic i definitely don't think they were in the um triassic Mm -hmm. yeah but they were in the cretaceous so it's like you got a few million years there that were missing yeah and I mean, that's just like one of those things that's hard to like comprehend. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, that's very true. And if you want to be pedantic too, you could say like dinosaurs are still around as birds. And then in, in that case, it's like, well, we're, you know, we're still in the age of dinosaurs. It's like everything yeah. coexists with dinosaurs. I mean, <laughs> yeah, humans will evolve and ho- evolve to be with dinosaurs. We did it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now we keep them as flipped. pets and taught them to speak. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, so I mean, I- I've seen y'all been to a lot of museums. Mm-hmm. So would you like to just speak on those a little bit? Um. Well, I guess my favorite museum I already said was the American Museum of Natural History. I think our favorite museum trip was we went to Australia and we I went through that. like we part of the reason we did this trip was somebody in Aromanga, which is in the outback in Australia, messaged us because we on our website, we have a map of dinosaur museums. We actually started that before we started the podcast. That was one of the first things we did. Oh. And they asked like, oh, could we be added to that? And we we're like, oh, yeah, sure. So we put them on this map. And then a couple years later, or maybe another year later, there was a big paleontology conference in Australia. And they asked us if we were going to it. And we're like, yeah, we're going to be there. And they're like, oh, we'll be here too. You should, you know, like stop by our booth or whatever. And then they're like, oh, and if you're really interested, you could come out to our museum. And then so I looked at it on the map and I was like, well, that's about a thousand miles from the conference like straight out into the outback and so that could be kind of tricky and then i found out oh there's some other dinosaur museums too and they call it the australian dinosaur museum trail or something like that so we went to multiple museums along this route and it was just that was really fun because sort of like when you're in the hell creek in montana you feel like you're out in the sort of prehistoric land because it's just so different than where you'd typically be you know it's just so barren and there's bones all over the place and there's footprints you can go see and there's just so much dinosaur stuff that's sort of exposed that it's really fun to get out there and see that stuff and so many of the people out there too are related are like involved with it when you go there and it's like you know a lot of the ranchers know about the bones because they find them on their properties and then there's these small museums and they're like a part of the sort of culture of the area it's just it's fun to be yeah, everybody's sort of got dinosaur dinosaur focused. Bones. yeah pretty much <laughs> so that was really cool i think that was our favorite dinosaur trip um but yeah we love all sorts of dinosaur museums we like the really big museums we also like the really small museums because then you can usually talk to people that are more involved with the museum more easily and a lot of times they have bones you can touch which is always fun so yeah i don't think there's been a dinosaur museum we've been to that we didn't really like (laughs) 
it, it's kind of hard to go wrong with that unless your museum mm-hmm. is like here's some dinosaur bones yeah they're dumb and everybody's like hey screw you buddy those are cool i mean one of the guys that i interviewed he is, is uh the title i guess would be the dinosaur cowboy mm-hmm. which is a really awesome name because i mean cowboys are cool dinosaurs are cool i don't mind mm-hmm. them and he actually was a cowboy, which is even cooler. So, I mean, um, so he was just like a rancher one day and he just, somebody came on the property and found like part of a triceratops frill. And he's like, oh, I can go find some dinosaurs. And he did. And now he's like a paleontologist. And it's like, mm-hmm. dinosaurs can change your life, man. Yeah, that's true. It's like, just the events of your life could just be completely altered by just finding a dinosaur bone. That's true. Yeah. And it's think, just every once so in a while, there's a kid too that finds one. And I'm like, that kid's going to be a paleontologist. <laughs> <laughs> You're just like, that kid's about to go find a billion more dinosaur bones. Yeah. I'm going to be happy about it. <laughs> I mean, just dinosaur related things. I mean, I said something earlier, I, the mammals, I'm not as, I don't hate them. I don't not like studying them. I love looking at mammals, but I don't know as much about them as dinosaurs. Granted, I don't know enough about dinosaurs as I should, which is why I started a journal of just dinosaur content. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot to look at. There's, just so much going on in the um that's the other dude that's the hill creek hooligans the dinosaur cowboy actually invited me to a museum in north carolina to go see one of the like newest um or one of his big discoveries which was the dueling dinos oh yeah nice which is a he said i think a new ceratopsian with and it will confirm whether whether nano tyrannus is its own species <laughs> There's a lot of promises with that fossil. T-rex. And I mean, I, and he's just like, you want to come out and see it? And I'm like, how are you casual about this? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, it's just like one of those things. You're like, if I found this thing, I'd be freaking out. Mm-hmm. But he's just like, yeah, we got it in the back. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know how you're so casual about this. And I mean, I remember interviewing him. He was just like sitting back, laughing, having a good time. He's like, oh, look, a sticky mullet skull. And I'm like, give me that now. <laughs> it's just, I guess, I don't want to say like desensitized to dinosaurs, but I guess after a while, you're just like, yeah, I'm I'm him with dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> just like, ah, oh, another T-Rex tooth. Ah, wake me up when we find a full skull. Yeah. It's like, what? Because <laughs> I mean, uh, one of those things that I like heard about was, I mean, they shed their teeth. Mm-hmm. So it's not, I don't want to say it's common, but it's not uncommon to find a T-Rex skull or not skull tooth. Yeah, I, I wish sure. it was like slightly uncommon to find a T-Rex skull. We but, do have like, a decent number of T-Rex skulls too. They got like 50 plus T-Rex skulls, which is way more than most dinosaurs. And didn't they estimate like, um, There was like 200 million T-Rex oh, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, someone did a paper which was sort of like just a very rough estimate of maybe how many T-Rex there could have been. But the error bars on that are huge too. I think it was like <laughs> yeah. Yeah, tens of millions to like tens of billions. <laughs> They're like, hey, it could be 200 million, oh, about 27. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, we don't actually know. I'm just guessing here. Mm-hmm. I would very much so like to see where where his work is, how he estimated this. It's it's in the paper. It, I mean, it's it's reasonable, but it it really does. It's one of those things where it's like every error compounds on it because it's like okay, well, we have to estimate how many, how much of the land was possible for t-rex to roam you know like were they limited to just close to hell creek or were they all of north america and so you've got error bars on that and then it's how long did they live and that gives you new error bars 
how many of them were in each ecosystem that gives you more error bars and you have to multiply like the smallest of all of them with the biggest of all of them and you end up with like this huge difference between you know yeah. the the least and, and also most. i mean because you could just like calculate how many people could live in a country that way you just do like land we divvy it up into boxes everybody gets a box but dinosaurs weren't like that they, yeah. they weren't civilized basically to say well yeah. as far as we know i mean dinosaur houses who knows <laughs> next theory i'm kidding um but i mean because you can't have like eight tyrannosaurs per one hadrosaur yeah That's exactly yeah so there had have to be fewer tyrannosaurs i mean you would have to have certain areas around them and i'm sure they were territorial so they definitely probably had a very big territory um because they're pretty big animals and if you like estimate it based on like how modern animals are they would have like a pretty decently large sized territory mm -hmm. so i mean there's like a lot of room for error yeah exactly yeah and, and the question too of like were they like wolves did they live in a pack with like seven or are they like other animals that are completely solitary, like the snow leopard again, where like snow leopards, they are so, like you were saying with territory, they have a ton of territory. They're completely alone most of the time. They see like another snow leopard like a couple times a year. <laughs> if they're doing that style or if they're like, like crows where it's just, you know, like a hundred of them all the time. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be horrifying. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's around this corner. Oh, that's a hundred tyrannosaurs. Well, yep, yep, I'm dinner. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the movie uh birds but it's just mm -hmm. tyrannosaurs instead of crows <laughs> yeah like, uh... so i mean one of my one of my favorite analogies was this dude on youtube that i just found one day because youtube was like hey i heard you like dinosaurs watch this mm -hmm. and it was uh their, their channel called dinosaur facts or dino facts or something along those lines Mm -hmm. He called Allosaurus the honey badger of dinosaurs, mm -hmm. which basically means it walked around not caring about anything. <laughs> it was basically like, I'm just going to kill whatever I can kill. And then eat it, which is like crazy to think about. Like, if there was an animal like that, but like the size of a theropod, imagine that, like, just like place it in a neighborhood. What's going on here? Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah. People freak out when they see bears. Imagine if they did see a T-Rex. Yeah. I, I don't want to see a T-Rex. I also think another similarity with honey badgers, because I remember one of the things about them was that they're just sort of durable. I remember this <laughs> famous did. video where it was like it gets bit by a poisonous snake and its response is to sort of like sleep it off. And then <laughs> <laughs> it gets oh, up... Yeah, the With, literal embodiment of I ain't got time to bleed. Yeah, Allosaurus, I think, still might have the record like a single fossil with the most paleopathologies or like injuries that yeah. are preserved in the bone. There's one that has over 10 injuries, it's got like a broken toe, <laughs> and I think it's got like a messed up rib, and it's got just like all these issues all over its body. I think some vertebrae are fused together from probably like a tail injury and stuff. Big. So Big owl, everybody's like, Oh, it's the toe injury, but he had like they were looking at the bones, there was like 14 other, yeah, things I think that it were, was like, big it owl, was yeah. messed up. And it's like, mm -hmm. uh, um, <laughs> it's like these things were definitely fighting a lot, yeah, very durable. I mean, even and even if it wasn't like constantly a, a hunting fight or like a fight with another allosaurus, even just like running and tripping can really yeah. mess up an animal and yeah so it definitely added up over time <laughs> and one thing that i saw pretty recently was about cranial facial biting mm -hmm. how that's something that's like just very common yeah i guess it's still common with animals today too because i was we talked about that in one episode we're like oh yeah there's these t-rex and they have like i think it was a t-rex they have um like scars on their face from being bit and then occasionally there's there's a couple dinosaurs where there's like a hole and it matches the shape of the tooth that it has so it's like okay it was probably like a sibling or a rival that like bit it so hard on the face that a, a tooth came through and one of our listeners said like yeah 
dogs do that too. I had to take my dog to the vet because the other dog like bit a hole in <sighs> and it like went through the bone. Like they did an x-ray and wow. there's like a hole in this jaw, this dog's jaw's bone now because the other yeah. dog bit it so hard. So yeah, it definitely yeah. is a real thing and not something you think about as a human because we don't bite each other on the face. <laughs> no, no, we're a bit we're a we're a bit more tactful. Yeah. And our anything. teeth are just like Probably not different. that strong. You know, like we use fists no. or feet or whatever, but like our mouths are really, really weak we compared to most animals. Crappy bite force. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that that's just one of those things that's like you see it and you see these dinosaurs with scars all over them, and you're like, because you even just like looking at this, it's like fairly pristine, fairly clean, not many nicks. Well, I mean. This probably isn't the best example because I've had this <laughs> one for a while. So this probably yeah. is more accurate. But like uh, one of the other ones, like uh take I'll burn this words here. Oop. Uh like the model is always very clean, very neat. There's not much to it, but they, they would have been like torn apart most of the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cause I mean granted, I, I'm sure they weren't just hunting all the times. So they weren't mindless murder monsters they were like like tactful animals like they would they wouldn't just like walk up and just start fighting something with like a broken leg they would be like yeah let's stay away from that for now mm -hmm. so i mean but something enters the territory and they got to fight it off that was very likely like um when the uh what was that old doc? I don't even Jurassic Fight Club. Oh, yeah. Very old documentary series. You watch it and you're like, this is horribly outdated. One of the things that they said was like Ceratosaurus would fight Allosaurus or Allosaurus would like kill Ceratosaurus. Hmm. And you think about it, and you're like, that kind of makes sense. I mean, Allosaurus was bigger. I'm sure Ceratosaurus would walk around and accidentally step into an Allosaurus's territory. And then Allosaurus is like, gotta kill you sorry i mean it's like i think also, a lot of times too it would be like sort of similar to how it goes with like humans you don't necessarily have to kill the person it could just be like you see the person you're like they're a lot bigger than me i'm gonna run away <laughs> yeah and the other you know the so in that case like the allosaurus would just be like you know just basically look or maybe roar at the ceratosaurus yeah. and the ceratosaurus is going to be like okay i'm i'm getting out of here and the allosaurus probably isn't going to even bother chasing it because one advantage these smaller animals tend to have is being a little quicker and more nimble and so like as long as they leave quickly you know it's probably not <laughs> worth it like, for the allosaurus hey. yeah <laughs> so i was just like i see you respectable yeah. i'm going this way yeah please don't follow me yeah i mean also, just to like think about that, these things could like just rip you limb from limb really mm -hmm. easily is kind of horrifying. And we're basically just sitting here like poking fun at their bones. <laughs> it's true. And it's like these things are dangerous. You think you think like a lion is dangerous? These things would eat a lion whole mm -hmm. without without like any effort. They would just like step on it and eat it as a snack. <laughs> because I mean. You you I don't know if you've seen it, but the Camp Cretaceous. Mm -hmm. You get like the smile on. It was chasing them, and then the um, Spinosaurus just went nah and just ate it. And you're like, <laughs> you're like, whoa! It's like a smile on. It just and you're like, wait, yeah, no, that that actually makes sense. That's how that would go. <laughs> smile on would think it's the top predator and it's defending its territory, and then this bigger dinosaur would just be like. We're not doing this today. <laughs> no. I mean, smil smilodons weren't anything to mess with either. I mean, I I I I, I like to poke fun at them because they're they're big kitty. They're a big kitty cat. I mean, who doesn't like like big kitty cats? I mean, but <laughs> they're also like really huge. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah. I also like I study things that are, we stuff. We personally study things that are like three times their size on like a bad day. Mm -hmm. You're like, eh, the big kitty cat doesn't really have that much shine, does it? 
I mean, <laughs> not to throw shade at Smile It On, because, I mean, I love Smile It On. It's one of my uh, favorite megafaunas. I mean, behind uh, Wooly Rhinoceros, this is a, uh, I don't even remember, like a Colo something. Uh, I'd have to look up the name. Um, but like Elasmotherium. Mm-hmm. The, mo- the more famous version of fuzzy rhino. I mean, the Siberian unicorn. I mean, they were still dangerous. And I mean, they still have their own shine. And if you like, I these things just boomed one day. They just popped out and were just like, we're taking over now. And that is one of the mammals are like a success story. Mm-hmm. They were struggling through the times of dinosaurs. They were like, oh, I'm this tiny little thing. Got to scurry into the burrow and hope that the Herrerasaurus or Coelophysis or whatever doesn't stick its face in the burrow and eat me. Mm-hmm. But then they're like, okay, now you're dead. Now we're big tires. We're t- uh, tires, tigers. We're elephants. We're rhinos. We're elk. What do you? We could actually pick on some dinosaurs now if they came back some yeah um, that's true yeah that's uh one of the things that people have said with you know like if a dinosaur got loose from like a Jura- like jurassic park to the lost world where it's like a t-rex running around or even with jurassic world fallen kingdom where it's like oh not uh, dinosaurs are everywhere or i guess it's dominion um both of them and it's like okay how how well would that work in real life and the answer is like you're saying all these niches are now filled with mammals. You know, there there yeah. isn't a ton of space for a T Rex to come in, and even even though it is bigger and stronger and all that kind of stuff, it would have to eat so much. And there are better adapted predators to the type of prey. Like, could a T Rex even catch a deer, for example, which is like one of the more common prey items around in North America now? Probably not. Like wolves can, but they can run a lot faster than a T Rex could, and they're a lot more nimble. And T Rex would have to catch so many deer compared to how many a wolf has to catch too. So, was yeah. there like a study like a well fit person could like out sprint a T Rex? And you're like, yeah, I think so. Makes sense. Like, I think so. Up. And it, especially when you factor in agility, because you're not usually like alone in a like in an alleyway where like you <laughs> it's just you know a straight drag race. Usually, even if you're in a field, you can turn. <laughs> mess with the agility and then if there's obstacles you know the main reason mammals were underground so much is because in a burrow nothing bigger than you can fit in because you make the hole the size of you. your size yeah yeah so like a, a human could easily take advantage of that or even climb a tree t-rex isn't going to chase you up a tree <laughs> the only thing i could see about that is could they push the tree over though oh possibly that's a good point <laughs> they might be if, able to you climb so it could be in trouble enough, can you climb high enough fast enough yeah. It catches you. Yeah. That's but true. That that's another thing about uh Jurassic Park. That like would a T-Rex actively hunt a human? Yeah, probably not. Like it, it, that would be like sprinting a mile to eat like one sausage. Yeah. It, you're and, not going to you're not going to survive. And we're yeah. also just not it's like a lot of animals you know, when you go like scuba diving or whatever and like sharks don't attack scuba divers usually because they're like, what is that? (laughs) We're not their prey, you know, we're not what they're used to eating. They see a person with like the big goofy mask and the bubbles coming out and the big flippers (laughs) on the feet and like not having fins, these big long skinny arms. And they're just like, I don't want to eat that. I don't know what that is. It's like when you go to a, a new country and you see like their most different food than what you're used to eating and you're like i don't know uh, you know like it takes you a I, second to be like this. how hungry am i that's like the math <laughs> that these, these sharks are doing too it's like how hungry am i is that do i want to try to eat that super weird i don't even know if that's that, food that's the that other person that would, like, i feel like mosasaurus could easily rain like the mosasaurus got out that would be like the worst part of it maybe pterosaurs too pterosaurs are pretty dangerous yeah, for sure. Especially like the big like Ashdar kid ones that have, you know, the huge like meter, two meter long, you know, like six foot long beaks and like stab. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Those would be really terrifying. That would be a nightmare. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Exactly. One of the other things that uh, was a was a joke that I heard someone make is imagine the size of the like poops that those things left. (laughs) You get like a like a bird poops on your car. You're like, ah, I gotta go to the thing. But that thing, you're like, man, I can't even drive my car home. (laughs) (laughs) It went destroyed. They would be disruptive. (laughs) I mean. Uh, the other thing is, like, how fast would humans just take care of them? Because uh, T-Rexes are dangerous if you're, like, an individual human and you try to go toe-to-toe with it. But, like, what is it going to do to a tank? Yeah. Yeah, there's... <laughs> especially those larger... Like, the things that are problematic for invasive species are, like, toads or small birds or, like, little lizards or things that can, like, hide and are, like, hard to trap and stuff. Like you said, <laughs> for, like, a T-Rex, they're easy to identify. <laughs> Like, I feel like the only way they would, um, like, I mean, I guess the most, like, the worst part would be, like, sauropods. Yeah. I mean, I mean they'd probably be pretty easy to call, too. Well, that's they, they'd, be, they'd be very easy to call, but they could still, like, kind of survive. They'd just eat the trees. And I, I feel like just the damage that they would cause just walking out would be the worst part. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like to infrastructure, like they, I don't think we could put them across a bridge. <laughs> I mean, I, I think like... elephants too, to your point, are like one of the bigger problems in Africa because you get like one angry elephant, they can just like level a small little village. Yeah. So they, yeah. You get like, like in the uh, Dominion movie, you had like an apotosaur. You get like an apotosaur in the suburbs. <laughs> you're getting at least a few houses knocked down <laughs> yeah. maybe one maybe two because it's going to be somebody's going to walk outside and they're going to scream they're going to be like what is that thing and it's going to spook it and it's going to go it's going to like bolt as fast as it can it probably wouldn't be that fast but yeah trip I, I over mean, like a house <laughs> That's yeah think about because sword pods were dangerous mm-hmm. they did not do them justice in those movies if anything, I feel like the first couple of Jurassic Park movies did the most justice to them by just showing that nothing messed with them. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh yeah, T-Rex got loose and there's a Brachiosaurus. T-Rex is not hunting a Brachiosaurus. Mm-hmm. There's no there's no way it would. There's no reason for it to. Uh, also, like, because, I mean, one of my uh, like favorite things that I studied is Brontomerius. Mm-hmm. The uh, thunder thighs. It would just like kick predators. <laughs> yeah. Imagine something like Diplodocus or Apatosaurus. Like they can rear up on their back legs. If you're like a small predator and you go under them and it lands on you, you're dead. It's over. It's mm-hmm. game over. And they they did that. They did that in like fossil history. You can see like fossil examples of that. And you're like. I don't want that thing anywhere near my house. I don't feel like that's covered by insurance. (laughs) That's true. I mean, I I guess with enough time, maybe they would like hunt each other or something. I don't know. It's definitely an interesting concept. And I feel like if a T-Rex got loose in like Africa or something, maybe it could hunt megafauna. Yeah. Like the last bit of megafauna, like it could hunt like <laughs> elephants, maybe a rhino, maybe some wildebeest or something. I guess maybe. Mm-hmm. But like in North America, I feel like a moose could outrun it. <laughs> That's true. I think so too. And it would have to like corner the moose and then eat it or something. Mm-hmm. But I feel like the worst part would be like the initial part where they're all spooked and they're just sprinting out everywhere. <laughs> Cause that's where the most damage is going to be. And, or like, um, the lost world where it gets loose in like San Diego and it's just mm-hmm. freaking out mm-hmm. the whole time. So it's just destroying everything. That's true. Like, that would be the worst part. The traffic accidents, just like deer. Yeah. It's always the car crashes that are the worst. <laughs> Rewatching that movie. I'm like, there's some stuff that maybe they should have left out. Like uh, the, all the Japanese dudes calling it Godzilla. You're like, Oh yeah. It's kind of, it's still funny. It's still got that charm, but you're like, 
And you're like, hey, how did you not get sued? Oh, wait, you own Godzilla. <laughs> you're the <laughs> That's I funny. You yeah, probably. It's either Universal or Disney at this point. So, but I mean, that, like, I mean, it's an interesting concept. And I feel like herbivores would have the best chance out there. Mm-hmm. Like, like they showed the ceratopsians with the rhinos and or the elephants at the end. Like I feel like that could be kind of worked out a little bit. And they yeah, were- the latest because the latest herbivores might have been eating like angiosperms, so there might be something similar today. But like if you went back to like Stegosaurus or something, where it's eating like cycads and horsetails and things, you might have a harder time finding food. Because from what we know, grass is fairly new. Mm-hmm. So would they really just graze on grass? No. I mean, <laughs> Which is a problem since so much of our planet is now covered in grass. Grass, yeah. <laughs> and also, like, you're like, oh, there's a dinosaur in Saudi Arabia. You're like, eh, give it a month. It'll yeah. die from dehydration and starvation. Just give it a month. <laughs> but, like, it took, like, a year to get a dinosaur black market up. You're like, really? Wait. <laughs> No, I could see it. People would definitely buy dinosaurs. That's true. I, I, I mean, and I, I saw this one thing. Things like protoceratops and like the tiny ceratopsians would be the worst part. Hmm. And it's not because of the environment. It's because of people. People would see it and they would go, it's so cute. Let's keep it as a pet. And then they would breed out of control. And like they're not, they're not gentle. They can like bite your forearm off. Mm-hmm. I mean, they weren't necessarily gentle creatures. And so you get like sixteen of them. And you're like, eh, we don't know what to do with them. And then it would be like some uh, Florida thing where they're just like, release them. <laughs> yeah. And then now they're all just out in the wild one day. And you're like, yeah. Oh, now there's like a billion of these things out in the wild. Yeah, I could see that. So, I mean, that things like that, I feel like, would be the worst part. Because I feel like the big creatures would very easily die off or get captured, mm-hmm. relocated, something. Yep. But those small creatures where people are going to be like, we're going to keep them as pets. <laughs> like Lystrosaurus, I can even possibly see maybe medium, like maybe something medium sized like Pachycephalosaurus by some like weird rancher people. Because I I would ride a Pachycephalosaurus. I'm just <laughs> no rush to scientists. I mean, it'd be a really fun day. I mean, <laughs> I mean, but also like the air content was very different. So that's the other thing. So the most realistic part would be in like a giant dome. Yeah, that's with true. Like very pristine air. And then once they get outside of it, they'd just be hazy and fall over because basically like suffocating. Yeah, it depends. That's another one where it's like it depends on which dinosaurs because some of them in like the Triassic, I think there might have been a little bit more oxygen, but for a lot of it, there was way more carbon dioxide. So it'd be interesting to see like how the respiratory system handled less carbon dioxide. It's kind of part of the reason why they're able to grow so big. I mean, maybe. But uh, for most of the Mesozoic, it was like not too different. A lot of it, they do have like more efficient lungs, though. So they, you know, that thing with their air sacs where when they breathe in, they fill the extra air sacs. And when they breathe out, it's like those air sacs fill the lungs. So they're constantly getting fresh air. It's really slick. Um, Yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how breathing, how they did with our atmosphere. (laughs) Whether there was more oxygen or less oxygen, that would still affect how they were. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It might be like a Kenyan uh, marathon runner who like trains at altitude and then they're, you know, in modern times and they have way more oxygen, less carbon dioxide than they're used to. And all of a sudden they're just like supercharged. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Let's go. (laughs) Uh, Chill, bro. You don't need the, you don't need the weird roid rage kind of deal here. It's not roid rage. It's oxygen rage. (laughs) And that, that would also probably make them really antsy too. 
It if could, yeah. I don't know. Less, if there was the possibility of less oxygen and now there's more of it, then they would just be like, what is going on? I got like so much more energy now. I can breathe <laughs> a lot easier. But if there, if there was more oxygen and now there's less, then they, they would probably just be like, it's nap time. Mm-hmm. I'm going to sleep. I mean, yeah, it's like it, it would just kind of depend on which one. And we don't really know that for certain. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I do, nap time. I think I might need to take my baby to nap time. <laughs> very soon. Yeah. All right. So we'll wrap this up real quick. So one last thing. I've mm-hmm. seen you've been doing some work with the documentary Why Dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. Would you like to speak on that just a little bit? Oh, yeah. Um, they're a really cool father ton- father-son team. So it's Tony and James Pinto. And it it was an interesting project because they started it when James, the son, was thinking about whether or not he wanted to be a paleontologist. And Tony, the father, was always interested in creating a documentary. He had done like other film projects or I should say like more commercial projects, you know, like videos over the years. And so he had a lot of expertise in this and he decided to make a documentary on like why there are so many dinosaur enthusiasts out in the world and yeah they made a really cool documentary and hopefully it'll be coming out soon they finished editing it maybe a month ago and they had a big premiere that they did in hollywood which was really fun sabrina and i got to go to that which was really amazing i was very impressed and yeah it was really fun to be a part of that but the dinosaur documentary series not about dinosaurs yeah it's about the people who study dinosaurs and it's really cool because in the beginning it was like it was truly about like just interviewing fans and then as they evolved through the documentary process it really became more of like a dinosaur documentary like there's a lot of the scientists talking about their work and where they think the science is headed and like what kind of research they've done so it's a really good documentary it's really enjoyable um and i'm excited for when people can see it but I don't know I when that will be or where that will be yet. So I can't share that because <laughs> I think they're still looking for a place to, to show it. Yeah. That, that's the, that's the worst part about putting things out there is trying to figure out who will take it to be able to put it out there. Mm-hmm. So that leads to the kind of obvious question of why dinosaurs? Oh, why do we like dinosaurs? I think. Yeah. I mean, why dinosaurs? I like the, um, the sort of diversity of them i sometimes compare them to pokemon because it's like (laughs) there's just like you know there's like there's the big meat-eating ones and there's like there's just so many fun little versions of them that from a distance since they're extinct you can just sort of appreciate this diversity of them and they don't have the problem of like oh yeah and they also like eat people because that's sort of the the downside to something like a shark where it's like oh they're really cool but they're also really scary because they're around and they might eat me Whereas with dinosaurs, it's like, well, they're gone. <laughs> and yeah. that adds an imagination level to it, too, because it's like, well, what exactly did they look like? Because we'll never really know 100% for sure. So there's like, yeah, there's a lot of things about them that are really cool. So I guess I'll let you go, man. It was really an honor talking to you. Yeah, you too. Thank you. That was, hang on. Let's go and pull up. Hey, got from that one. <laughs> uh, it was, this was, blah, blah. This was I Know Dinosaurs. They have a very amazing podcast. Please go check it out. It it is personally one of my favorite podcasts for just dinosaur information. Um, So, yeah, there's there's their Instagram. Go check it out. (laughs) Thank you. So I I guess I'll keep in touch and message you later about something, anything. Yeah, so I'll let you go now. All right. See ya. See ya. So that was I Know Dinosaurs. I'm going to put their YouTube on screen real quick. So there is their YouTube channel. Ooh. So go check that out too. That way, yeah. Go check that out too. And while you're checking that out, go check out. I don't know how you're watching this without checking out one of these things, but the Prehistoric Life Podcasts youtube channel go check that out too because i try to release all this content earlier on there just 
so y'all can get it out on there. Um, while you're also checking that out, and you're checking the I Know Dinosaur uh, people out on Instagram, go check out the Prehistoric Life Podcast Instagram page. That's where I post additional content on top of when I'm doing interviews, what's going on for the week, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, things like that. And if you want to just find all this one place, all this in one place on one easy surface, just go to your nearest search bar, prehistoriclifepodcast.com. From here, as you can see, the last episode, that's up right now. There were technically two episodes before this by the time this comes up, but that's semantic, was the 2024 Year of the Dinosaur interview with Fossil Crates. So go check that out too. That was an amazing interview, and there's some other content that should be between that. Um, but from here, you can get to the YouTube page by clicking on the YouTube button and the Instagram page by getting by clicking on the Instagram button. Uh, but yeah, that's just the overall spot for that. And remember... There is something else going on that you need to check out. If you are going to get a crate from Fossil Crates, I have this one pulled up. As I said earlier, Allosaurus is my favorite dinosaur. Please use pre blah, 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 prehistoric code. Please use the prehistoric life podcast promo code. It it's where am I putting that way? It's down there in the box. It's the promo code is just prehistoric life, and you get a free Velociraptor claw, a free Fossil Crates Velociraptor claw in your crate. Please use that promo code. It will show that you not just support me, but the people that you, blah, blah, the, the people that I interview and that I bring on this show, because we do care about them. We care about them. And while you're checking out all their stuff, you might as well check out the Fossil Crates Instagram page and give them a follow because they also have a lot of amazing in, uh, interviews, content. So please go check those out. And yeah, that, that is all for this episode. So thank you, Garrett. I get family lives hard. Uh, I would have loved to interview you both, but th there was still a real big honor having you on. And I would love to get back in touch and do a complete episode with all three of us. But Remember, there's the page, there's the blah, 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 website, so go check that out. But till next time, I am your host, Eric Crawford, signing off. This has been Prehistoric Life Podcast. I'll see you all next time, and remember, keep it prehistoric. Goodbye.